I think uh, we have a few, uh, quite a few. All right, come, come in, come in, come in, sit down. Uh, let's like, let's get a little bit started. This is um, uh, this is the the last DM all hands meeting at a PCW since it's the last PCW, and it's I think they're quite enough, Robert. It's okay. <laughs> um, it's also the first one where where I've said it's data management becomes. Uh, uh, system performance and data production and operations, and so I think we have plenty of people from the operations end of things here as well. And so uh, this is, let's say, it's for all of things to do with data going forwards. Uh, and I'm just have a little, sort of, uh, a few friendly reminders to start us off. To so start at a PCW, uh, so you'll see this a bunch. I didn't get my sticker. People have uh, different stickers are for the name badge, whether they like fist bumps or whether they want their space, etc. So please uh, respect that. Uh, everybody's wearing their mask. I see a couple of people drinking, that's fine. And otherwise, uh, we, we, we're wearing masks indoors for everybody's comfort. Um, there are people that you can contact if you feel that with any aggressment or harassment. We do have a code of conduct. It's a, it's a longish document that you can read, but effectively, uh, we want to have a safe, you know, diverse space for everybody and, and respect people's boundaries and, and what they want to do. Um, so please, uh, if you have any problems with that, uh, feel free to t say to me if there's something, but also uh, Ranpal, Andy Connolly, and Melissa Graham are listed as uh, de de designated contacts for any issues uh, concerning that, those activities. Okay. Um, then I think we have, yeah, we uh, have virtual participants on here. Uh, we do have a, a moderator for the virtual end of things, Leanne, she's waving her hand up here in the front. Uh, so people who are on the remote, if you have an issue, you can uh, talk to Leanne. I think she wants to take Slack messages directly. Um, we can't actually hear Leanne. You gotta got come to the microphone if you wanna say that. We all had personal mice at the Slack meeting this morning, microphones. Um, so I propose that we use the Slack channel for all questions and discussions. That way um, I don't have to monitor the blue jeans and the Slack, plus we also have the whole history that we can dump out and refer to later. Um, as per standard practice, please thread discussions in Slack, otherwise it can easily turn into a, a nightmare of, of questions all over the place. Uh, I think that's it. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, okay, so that's for the remote participants uh, and everybody else here, there's a microphone. And again, if you are going to ask a question, please come to the microphone. Um, from, from my part, you can interrupt anytime you want, come to the microphone, ask a question. I'm happy to take them during the, the next 30 minutes. And I think the same is true for Christian and, and everybody else. We have one remote pre presentation from Richard. We checked that's all working okay, so he'll be on screen and remote. Uh, questions for him, I guess, have to go the other way via Leanne or someone will have to interrupt him so he can see who's asking a question. Okay, that said, uh, so right now I'm gonna go through a few highlights. Um, I said 50 minutes, that's not right. I think it's more like 30. Uh, and then we have the uh, data facility with Richard. Uh, we have a few minutes on Butler Gen 3 with Tim. And I want a Christian just to tell us where we are with the long haul networks because we all wanna know how our data is gonna get to the US and how that's gonna work. Uh, welcome everybody then to our um, DMDP and, and ORP, I missed it off this one, system performance. Put it in the text, I didn't put it in the header. Uh, data production system performance. Um, and I would say thank you to everyone uh, for your continued efforts in making Ruben work. Uh, it's a lot of effort and especially with COVID and everything else, it's been a tough few years recently. Uh, starting up operations has been uh, a new experience for all of us, uh, bringing new people on board. And so I know that's uh, something for everyone. And next year, I'm hoping that we get a, a big bunch of people. Uh, I'm aiming mainly at the construction people who've been working for many years on the project, but uh, we can see if we can get 50 more. We'll have a joint technical meeting, and that's hopefully in Chile. And uh, I don't think we have quite a date for that in March yet, but user's working on it. He's not here to say something. Okay. Um, you are here. Was there anything to add to that, or do we have a date yet? Oh, okay, so we're still maybe March 13, but we still have to pin that down with, with uh, Victor and everybody else. Okay, so uh, that's excellent. And I know Chelko's not gonna ask a question, he's just wondering. In it. Okay, that's for next year. Uh, so data management organization, uh, we've been pretty stable. Uh, Michelle Butler retired and that's been, um, you know, well, 
It was great having Michelle on the team. Steve is taking over from her uh, on the NCSA side. He's been on the project forever, so it's not a new face for us, and he knows everything that's going on, and that's great. Uh, Robert Grendel also moved off to a new project. Robert Lupton, who's down there, also moved to commissioning. And so we had a couple of changes, like uh, uh, Jim Bosch is becoming our pipeline scientist, and Eli is the calibration scientist. Um, <clears throat> so those are kind of the, the top level changes. I do need to update the management document um, to see how that's uh, picked up. As I said, we're moving into operations. So we have on the one side uh, data production. So DM kind of splits a little bit. Um, and the one side we have data production, and that's pretty much like the DRP and alert side, more or less. Uh, and as you see on here, then we also have the data facility that's at the US side of the US data facility. And we bring in the French and the UK data facility. Uh, so you'll see some Fabio who's here and George who might be online, Richard who's remote uh, from the data facilities making up a sort of advisory committee for, for me on that side of things. I also broke out a little bit on the bottom here um, under infrastructure under Richard. He has a bunch of different teams looking after specific things like uh, data curation. And you see that we're starting to populate these with names. So there are people um, responsible for all of these parts of the project in, in operations. They were starting up over the last year or so and, and really ramping up. And DP 0.2, of course, was something. And DP 0.1 was something that they were all involved in. Um, otherwise, you'll see some familiar names and similar looking sort of team names uh, on the data production side. And the other part of this is the uh, system performance. That's with Leanne. So again, Leanne's been with us on, on the construction side, so no big change there. And you'll again see some familiar names under Leanne for different things like verification, community engagement, etc. So again, familiar names from the construction side. So it's people who understand how the project works and have been moving into operations. And other than this, there are new people coming on board as well. Um, okay, so I think that's uh, just a little bit how we're going. Uh, the, we had a huge set of milestone uh, outstanding last year at the review. We were way behind on many, many things. Uh, this is looking much better. Uh, this graph is just showing you what, where, what, how many milestones we should have finished and, and what, how many we've actually finished. A little gap here. Uh, Gap looks a lot bigger than eight to me, but I didn't get my little measuring tape out and measured very exactly. So let's say it's, it's eight according to the uh, official document because I looked it up. So we're, we're behind by only eight milestones now, which is much better than we were before. I'm not going to say that that's all due to fantastic work on our part. It's partially due to the fact that the project finally got a reschedule and many things moved. And with it, many of our milestones also moved and made this uh, curve a little flatter, which is uh, better for us. We did finish many things as well, which is kind of good. Uh, then, speaking generally about construction, uh, you're going to hear loads from Victor about this, I think, in his plenary anyway, where we are with everything. Uh, obviously, we have, you know, an observatory. It's great. And I think most of you have seen pictures of this. It's kind of under two meters of snow at the moment, and the electricity keeps going out every five minutes. <laughs> but apart from that, it's, uh, it's a great building, and, and, you know, it's dry mostly inside. There's a couple of leaks here and there, but it's pretty good. Uh, I highlighted a couple of things here. That there's now a live document, DMTN232, uh, live in that I update it at least once a month from Primavera, so you'll get the latest version, the latest dates for all of these things every month updated on this document. Um, and on the previous page, you saw DMTN158. That's also coming directly from Primavera, so it's directly linked to the project schedule. So you can see these dates. And I highlighted just a couple. I think the big thing, if nobody minds, I'm going to take this mask off <laughs> so I'm not suffocating up here. I'm, I'm far enough away from you. Um, the TM, the, the, uh, well, TMA is going to try and complete this year, but the big thing I think that, that the big step for construction is EPO finishing and getting handed over to into operations, and that's kind of a big, big thing. And the next thing to look out for next year is Engineering First Live with ComCam. We're hoping to get ComCam on Sky and actually take some pictures and actually see some real data coming off the telescope, um, but that's a lot of work for the next while to get that happening. But those are the two that I highlighted just for interest. These are a couple of pictures I took in June. That's the, the observatory with a little bit of snow, not two meters like it is today. And we actually have a control room up and running that's used for Augustel, which is kind of fun. A um, bunch of new people have started. Um, I don't, uh, Carlos is here. Carlos can sh shake his, wave his hand. Uh, we have uh, Brianna, Aaron, Aaron, Nima, I think Nima is here at least. Who else is here? Nima, Brianna, okay. Aaron, all right. Uh, in Andy isn't here, right? No? Okay. 
All right, so new, new people from DM, uh, so please uh, say hi to them and, and welcome them to the DM project. Um, and Erfan, I think he was here as well, right? No? Erfan didn't make it. No, all right. He's at the meeting, but he's not in this room. All right, okay, so look out for those people. Um, I'm not going to go through all the names on the operations side because quite a lot of people joined into operations coming on, especially with Slack. Uh, lots of people have joined us. I don't know if there are any of them are here. If you are, please wave your hand and say you're in the ops group. One at least. Okay, two. Well, Fabio's there. Yeah, okay. Three, four, five. Okay, good. All right, so there are a handful here at least. Um, so look out for those as well, please, and, and say hi to them. And same on system performance side, uh, but a big lot of people joining us. We also had some staff highlights. I uh, encourage you all to look at staff highlights. They're always fun to read what our colleagues do for their pastimes as well as their work. Um, some things we didn't always notice. And uh, we've had about 10 of those since the last meeting in the last year from DM. And thank you uh, to the staff for contributing to that. Uh, so status and achievements. And I do want to check time a little bit because I'm trying to, okay. Get, give time to Richard. Um, the US data facility, I'm not going to actually say very much about this because Richard's going to come on in a little while and tell you all about it, Richard Dubois, but it is at Slack. That's great for us. Uh, it's a hybrid model. That's uh, also very interesting. So we will have Google involved in operations. We haven't quite got the details of that worked out, but it's going to, it's, it's in the works. We have an okay for it. Um, we have a French data facility and Fabio, did you want to, uh, this is, Fabio Hernandez, uh, he's come all the way from IN2P3, so give him at least one minute to tell us about IN2P3. You can take it off the thing if you Yeah. Yeah, do that. There we go. That works. I'm supposed not to touch this. So hello, my name is Fabio Hernandez. This is my face. Um, so I am based in Lyon. I work for IN2P3, and I have been involved in LSST since seven years now, doing several things. and still learning how this project uh, is working. So this is a nice picture taken by you probably, Will, of the, one of the uh, churches in, in Lyon. But this is not the site where LSST will be located. This is the, the site where it is uh, located. So this is um, a recent picture of, of one of the two machine rooms that, that we have for, for the hardware. Uh, and we are preparing to perform uh, DRP and, and process half of the data um, of, of the raw data and to store a full copy of, of all the data, so both um, raw and processed data. This is, this is our target. Uh, and we have been doing several exercises uh, of processing, uh, previous one and currently doing DP02 in parallel with uh, what has been done here in the US. And the goal for us is um, first to learn uh, how the system works, and second, make sure that uh, our infrastructure is um, good enough and can cope with what uh, we are preparing to do. Um, um, we have been also uh, getting experience with QSERFs of the, the catalog database, and that is uh, even longer, it, is, it started in 2013 or 2014, something like this. Um, uh, so we run a cluster, uh, uh, a QSERF cluster, uh, which is used for both uh, development and by the scientists, but trying to be the scientists uh, doing queries and trying to, to get answers from, from that um, uh, cluster. And we have also deployed uh, two instances of the, of the science platform one in Lyon, one in Nancy, in, in another lab of i 2 p 3 And uh, our goal is to serve uh, French scientists with, with, those, um, with those platforms. Uh, okay, I think that's all. I can Thank you, Fabio. And uh, we also have a, now a UK data facility. So UK will do 25% of processing. George, I don't know if George is online or not. I don't think he is. He wasn't. Online. I am. Can you hear me? He is. Ah, sure. Do you want, do you want to say, say a few words, George, since you're there? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're coming out oh, here. Oh, good. Okay. So my name is George Beckett. I'm based in Edinburgh. And uh, I've been involved with LSST in the UK since around 2016. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, recently, as part of our in-kind proposal, we have uh, offered to take on 25% of the data release processing um, for 
uh, Rogan Production, and that will run here in the UK on a shared infrastructure called Iris, which is um, funded by our <coughs> excuse me our main <coughs> research council, and is um, designed to cover not just the Rogan Observatory but also other major uh, facilities that the UK is involved with, such as June. SKA and the LHC. Um, we have been, as has uh, Fabio and his team, getting experience with the key technologies. So we are running the LSSD stack and we have been processing VISTA data um, using the stack. And in fact, this is one of our uh, in-kind contributions is to augment LSSD data with near infrared data from VISTA and potentially later from other infrared surveys. We're also running a, an instance of the science platform and have contributed a small number of uh, bug fixes and other elements um, into the, the code base. We're running on OpenStack here in infrastructure, which is hosted in Edinburgh, and you can see there. Um, we are also running several QServe instances. Uh, one of them is hosting DB0 and some Vista data, and the other one is uh, meant to be a sort of benchmarking exercise which we will, will be operating along with uh, colleagues in France and potentially the Science Cloud instance of QServe to compare the performance of different configurations, um, bare metal right down to uh, or right up to um, fully cloud virtualized. Um, the Rusio and Panda, which some of you may know about, are the underlying technologies that are sort of preferred for the data distribution and the job distribution across the three, three sites. And in the UK, we have quite a lot of experience both with Rusio and Panda. In fact, in Edinburgh, there's quite a large development team for Rusio. And so we're um, helping to um, kickstart those early experiments with data distribution and job distribution. And uh, I think they're going pretty well. We are now at the stage where we are able to distribute data between the three sites, not necessarily very quickly, but it is going. And we're on the verge of being able to run um, small jobs at each site as well. So I think that's in, in good order. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Oh, I was going to say, I'm, I'm really sorry. I was meant to be there this week. I was looking forward to my 22 hour travel with Fabio, but unfortunately KLM decided that wasn't a good idea. So unfortunately I'm joining in the middle of the night from Edinburgh. So I'm sorry, hopefully I'll get to meet you all in person next time. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, cybersecurity, I think I mentioned this last time as well. We, we do have some extra cybersecurity we have to put in place. Uh, we have to do some encryption. We have to do some delays of data. Uh, we haven't, we've just got the supplemental funding request done to start putting this, to implement this. So now it's official. We will be doing this over the next year. Um, impact for most people is minimal. We do have a little bit of DM work to do to implement a couple of things. Um, and the rest will be dealt with on the science side as to what the impacts of that are. Small, but a little, little bit of impact on the science side of things. Uh, I don't think I want to really say more about that. Um, I do want to mention Data Preview 0 0.2. This is, again, an interesting transition where we've developed a bunch of things on the construction side. We've handed them over to operations to some extent. In some places, that's the same people taking it over on the uh, operations side. And in some cases, it's some new people who've been running it on uh, Google. Um, and there's a nice picture here of a, a, a dipole found by uh, Gregory in, in some of the data that was coming from the simulation, uh, showing a potential error in our um, in our image in our uh, difference imaging. But anyway, uh, so so some interesting stuff coming out of that already. Um, and uh, there's a couple of papers I think linked there. There's one on the science platform and uh, all the documentation, etc. And I think everybody in DM has access to this platform, so you can all uh, play with this data. Um, and at the moment, we're up to 600 delegates allowed on Google. I think we only have about 450, 500. Um, but in principle, uh, seems to be it seems to have scaled up well from the first couple of hundred to the second 400 or so. And um, we'll need to step up over the next year to get that up to a few thousand. Um, and I know Frosty will be working on that. Uh, and then DP 0.2 in June, uh, again, uh, I think this is a nice uh, depth image coming out of the, uh, the end of the pipelines uh, from Eli. And uh, again, our middleware butler, Tim had an SPIE paper, I've linked it in here. Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, all of this working together, very nice. 
not to say it's finished, still plenty of things that have to be worked out to make it usable by thousands of scientists in a couple of years, but it was a good uh, initial demonstration of everything. And all the catalogs loaded into QServe and that all worked well. Uh, DM Science, bunch of things happening as always. Um, the, the middleware acceptance is great. We're going to get a bunch of more ver uh, requirements verified from this um, and, and pulled into our VCD. Uh, lots of acceptance test campaigns uh, for DP0.2 especially. And then uh, image services that were went into that, the, uh, the DS source measurements. Uh, again, a lot of this relates to verifying requirements and, and Leanne and her team have been doing a really good job of that. Um, alert distribution, again, being handed over and talking to Antares, and I know Adam is here as well from Antares' side. Um, and networking requirements with Josh, he's been going through how to re-verify those. And Khaled Palooza, um, that's on 25th, 26th of August, yeah, okay. It will be in person. Virtual component. Okay, so in person with a virtual component. Excellent. Um, not not here. That'll be at Slack or something. Slack. Yeah, at Slack. Um, sorry, someone was just indicating, which I think the question was, was it going to be here? So Slack. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and that's to end-to-end uh, -end, uh, LSST calibration, which will be uh, very important. Square, I know, Frosty, are you here? Did you want to say something or... And if the others want to get themselves, uh, if user and people want to get lined up to the microphone, we can bang these out in a minute each or something like that. Or come here is also fine, yes, Rita. Uh, can you hear me? I think you're going to have to rotate it a little bit to you. There you go. Does this work uh, better? Works. All right, okay. Um, so I'm not going to read the slide. Uh, just wanted to uh, advertise yet again a naming change. So um, originally there was a plan for... Uh, the engineering facilities database, which was the EFT, uh, and then we implemented a different implementation of it that was still called the EFT, and now we're using it for more than the EFT, so that created a giant cascade of naming uh, conflicts and confusion. So we'd like to advertise Sasquatch, which is the name for the, you know, the software and the services that underlie uh, curating the telemetry database, and we're going to be using it for other things. So Sasquatch is a software, EFD is the actual telemetry database that has the actual data in it. So uh, you want to hold on to that. And just wanted to say how happy we were with the DP0.2. Here's another screenshot uh, showing the uh, footprints, I guess, the, our own HIPS data generated by Eli. Um, this was a really big uh, preview. Uh, I know for the folks who are not excited by simulated data, it doesn't seem like a lot, but for us it was the first opportunity to uh, push data, produce, process by our science pipelines all the way through to the services, and a whole bunch of people had to, like, you know, uh, pitch in and work out the gaps, and it worked really well, and super confident it's going to go even better when we have real on sky data. So, thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah, so... The past year has seen a lot of, uh, or even the past six months, has seen a bunch of changes from the architecture standpoint, including uh, implementation of Python 3.10. So I think a lot of people are looking forward to using some of the features from that. Um, the change log that people use a lot to look at uh, what has changed in the stack uh, with each release now has a completely new implementation that's uh, much improved over the previous one, thanks to Matthias Witkin. Um, we've also contributed to the DP0.2 integration. And uh, now coming to the USDF, at long last, you will have daily releases in a shared stack. Um, so you can use uh, what happened just last night. Um, there are reusable workflows that have been implemented throughout our GitHub repository, so we can easily uh, uh, be consistent about how we're using our linting tools. And there are a bunch of things uh, that are sort of verging on the upside in terms of prompt processing direct image transfer to the USDF, and uh, how we're doing the data backbone that transfers all the data between these various data facilities um, that we've been working on. So. Is there a, Ian, right? All right, uh, so within uh, alert production, we've been doing a lot of work lately on building on uh, finalizing the infrastructure and testing that that is going to be needed to actually release our alerts quickly from LSST. Uh, this began uh, earlier this year with Eric Bellum and Spencer Nelson uh, getting a test with the uh, actual uh, alert brokers where we had a fully simulated alert stream 
and all of the, every one of the official alert brokers was able to connect to that and get a full stream of alerts at the expected data rate. Other advances that we've been working on, we've had work on our building up the prompt processing prototype, so getting a system in place that will allow us to process the data in real time as it comes off the mountain, and we've been testing that with data from DC2, pushing that through, and then also being able to understand how long it currently takes to run the alert production pipeline, since that is a deadline. Currently, we are running at about 200 seconds. We can do better. Other advances along those lines are related to improving the infrastructure of alert production. As we've refactored image differencing in order to make it more modular, better tested, and able to better support other styles of convolution and other algorithms. And at the very bottom there, one of the, we have been highlighting, in addition to these functionality improvements, we have many new speed improvements, and just wanted to highlight one that was rather significant by dropping down some of our code down into C++ and rewriting that. We're able to get factors of 10 improvement in individual algorithms, and that work will continue. Science pipelines continued. We had a wild ride this year. We, okay, fall, we finalized the pipeline for DP0.2, which was the first time we ran things like the DIA pipeline, made more parquet tables, and ran the pipelines on Gen3. Then this spring, we finalized the pipelines for the HSC public data release 4. To prep for that, we switched on a lot of new algorithms by default. That includes PIF for PSF estimation, the pattern continuity algorithm, and Scarlet Light, which is, I think the last time we talked, we were a little bit worried that Scarlet would, we wouldn't have the computational resources for it, but we are no longer worried about that now. That is all I will say. To support all of these feature changes, we invested a lot of time in monitoring the pipeline quality and tooling to do so. So we've converted the functionality that was in pipe analysis to analysis DRP. And then when that was done, in order to share more code with Faro and better prep for commissioning, we started building a package called analysis tools where the code is more modular, reproducible, and shared. Nate's gonna give a demo about that tomorrow. And... Yeah, just press the button. And yeah, if you wanna know any more about ah, science yes. pipelines, there's gonna be <laughs> a, uh, a whole session on it Wednesday at 11 a.m. Thank you. Fritz, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> um, sorry, sorry not to be there in person. So uh, uh, in the DAX group, we've been uh, pretty focused on QServe. Uh, you know, uh, we added some uh, index accelerated geometry that's used by the portal um, to query metadata um, and some new photometry UDFs. Most of the, a lot of work's been going on in the ingest APIs, but getting a real workout um, by our colleagues at IN2P3 ingesting uh, multiple data products and ourselves and the various data previews. Uh, lots of, uh, again, contributions. Thank you to IN2P3 for pushing forward the uh, Kubernetes operator for QServe, which really makes a difference in, in how easy it is to install and maintain an instance. Um, our, cat our catalogs in DP0.2 are up to the 100 billion row range now, like we have 100 billion, uh, 111 billion force sources, I think, in the DP0.2 catalog, and we've been serving that to hundreds of science platform consumers um, uh, out of the Google Cloud as part of DP0.2. That's been um, uh, uh, fun to see that come to happen. And then uh, there's also been a load testing campaign, so if you're monitoring the room, you may see uh, Christine Bannock and myself on there late in the evenings nattering back and forth um, as uh, as we kind of pelt uh, the TAP service in QServe uh, under load testing. Um, that's been going well, and we've been learning a lot from that. that we'll turn around and make some more improvements uh, for the next go-around. 
And then our group also lends out some uh, development effort to other teams on the project. So uh, we have uh, Andy Salnikov uh, contributing to the Gen 3 Butler group, and uh, I'm doing a little bit of work uh, with Richard on USDF, and uh, also now a little bit of work with Eric Charles on campaign management. And there's a link to the schema browser at the bottom if you need to see the schema. Yep. Thanks, Ritz. Uh, Christian, but anyway, Christian's going to talk a little bit later about networks, so yeah, he'll he'll be up in a minute and he'll show you himself. A couple of things I did mention there: the the light fibers all the way up to the TMA is a big thing that the Chile Chile DevOps team have been up to, uh, getting those fibers in place. Then also the test stands, Tucson test stand, and the base test stands coming up soon. Um, I think those are the big things, and then obviously all the, the long haul network testing and all of that kind of stuff is going on, and lots of firefighting. Those guys are always helping us keep stuff together, especially power goes off all the time. Uh, I did want to remind everyone that uh, all our NCSA machines will be switched off on, or at least they will go off the network on August 15th and you will no longer be able to access them. And there is no guarantee of any data created between now and then of actually getting to Slack. Everything up to 1st of August is already at Slack. I know it's being unpacked and it'll be available soon if it's not already there. But I just wanted to point that out to everybody again. We should be, no, I don't want anyone to be taken by surprise by going, oh no, I did a huge amount of processing last week and it's all gone. Um, that will happen in a week or so. So just to bear that in mind. And I would like to thank very much uh, Steve and everybody at NCSA because they've made this a very painless process uh, and could have been much more complicated and much more difficult to do. So I appreciate their effort on that quite a bit. Um, Verification, uh, I've said a little bit about this already and we're out of time, so I'm not going to go into this in detail, uh, but basically ongoing activity, big thing for us for the next while is verifying. We got lots of stuff working, now we just got to tick the requirements off and show that we've tested it and prove to Ed from NSF that it's all good, right? Uh, we, did, we did our job. Um, so we've got a, quite a bit of work to do there. <laughs> our verification matrix hasn't changed very much since last year, so I'm well, I pulled a new version yesterday. But anyway, there's a bunch of tests that haven't actually been recorded in this yet, so it's a bit better. By the time we get to the review, Ed will see a much better picture. Remember this number, this very low number. Ed, it'll be a higher number when we get there. Okay. Um, 2023, uh, we're going ahead. We've had our two data previews. That's been great. Uh, we expect to spend a bunch of time on commissioning and especially this big list of missing functionality. Uh, so, you know, we may redirect some effort in DM into getting some things done on the summit. Uh, which is very important, obviously, because if we can't get through commissioning, we can't get finished. Um, I did want to mention, I think Bob has now spoken to everybody who's in the room uh, who's moving into ops. I think that the, all those conversations have been had. If not, please tell me. Um, and uh, we can continue to have the pre-ops money for a while, so that's helping us to stretch our construction. Um, and again, I, I know there's always been this question of, there is a preference for ops staff to be in Tucson or to be at Slack. Uh, but that's not meaning that we're trying to get rid of everybody who's in a university at the moment. They're all going to stay there. There's nobody going to be told in the first year of ops, oh, by the way, everything's at Tucson, so please don't worry about that. Um, in the future, of course, if, places, if things come free, we'll always try to do that first in one of the institutions, uh, Slack or um, Tucson. Um, okay, then uh, I think everyone kind of knows this. We still have IDF on Google. Uh, USDF is ops funded, so this is for your, if you're wondering, am I doing ops work or am I not doing ops work? You're working on the IDF or you're working at the USDF, it's ops, ops funded. Um, and otherwise, lots of support stuff is also considered ops, like all the summit support that we do is considered ops. Uh, I think Frosty's team knows that. Um, I think at this stage, most people kind of understand or they're having tickets created by their CAMs in the correct area anyway. Um, okay, then uh, last thing I just wanted to say, and I'm not gonna go through this, we have a bunch of different interesting talks, including Melissa's right now in another room um, for getting people set up. And uh, thanks to her for doing that and missing out on the DMO lands, but that's, uh, that has to be done as well sometimes. A Bunch of other things, I tried to capture most of them on here and give you links to them directly and times and where they are uh, if you wanna show up to some of those uh, and support uh, DM people or if you're interested in some of those topics. Uh, and uh, with that, I am kind of just a few minutes over, so we're not too bad. And I'm gonna hand over to Richard and uh, maybe I can, Richard, can you can you take over? Or do I have to stop sharing? Hello, Richard. Um, Finding the right button on Legend. Um, How did you go? Yeah. So, do I do you have to unshare so I can share? Yeah, maybe that's the case. Let me do that. Try that. Yeah. See if you okay. can do share now.
How's that? Uh, yeah, okay. that looks good. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so uh, so Will did give a, a little of a preview, so I'll skip over some of the things quickly at the beginning. Uh, but or, you know, a reminder that we're going with a, a hybrid model. So uh, processing our storage archive, uh, QServe, those sorts of things will be uh, at Slack for the for the USDF. Uh, we will have a staff RSP uh, for staff developers and commissioners. Um, and then the science users will be going into cloud. So this is you know, for elasticity, all sorts of good things. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a little bit. But just remembering the, the division of labor there and that uh, the commissioning and the like support will be at Slack. Okay, so again, division of scope. So science users in the cloud uh, will provide personal storage, CPU, uh, cloud access with co-eds, um, and then you know, effective 500 cores added per year, two to 10 petabytes of storage. And then at Slack, same thing I said before. But the processing, our share of it, uh, QServe, storage archive, serving alerts, and a home for developers and staff and commissioners. Okay, so Will showed um, this slide earlier, like who is in the USDF, so presented to you by Ops. And over on the right-hand side, I've tried to give you uh, some subdivision in the teams. So Shinfang leading the processing, group and folks from Fermilab and Slack uh, working on that. Data curation, working with Rusio and the like, uh, being led out of Fermilab, Brandon White leading that charge. Uh, Slack infrastructure, people have been working with Wei Yang quite a bit uh, on connecting various pieces together. And um, I wanted to highlight Panda, uh, which comes to you from our Brookhaven colleagues. And here's the, the Panda team. Um, and then finally, uh, out of Fermilab, we were able to get some excellent Postgres, Postgres database administrator effort uh, from Olga and Chris. So teams coming together, lots of stuff to do, and we're working hard at it. Okay, so at Slack, we're connected to our, our computing folks. Um, they're embedded in the Technology and Innovation Director, TID, and these are the scientific computing services. So down here in blue in the bottom are the various teams that we interact with. Um, so far, we've been interacting mostly with uh, Wei Yang and Yi Ting Li's teams for the science applications and HPC platforms, and storage is starting to uh, get a lot of attention. Experimental systems is installation of the hardware, so they're putting the stuff in the racks on the floor. And of course, networking is the core networking. Uh, we do get some uh, assistance from Slack IT, so sysadmin efforts, site networking, and also accounts and help desk, which many of you have interacted with already. Okay, so where is this stuff going to be? Traumatic photo of a building. Um, so S3DF is the cluster that we're gonna be living with, the shared Slack, Slack shared science data facility, bit of a mouthful, living in the Stanford Research Computing Facility. Um, so this existing building is being doubled in size. That work is, is underway and construction is well along to go to the more modern photo. Uh, construction started last November and we expect to be start using it next spring. So before there were delays, that was kind of more exciting, but now I think it's much more comfortable. Um, we'll have six megawatts of power, 300 racks. Interesting power infrastructure kind of like the, the flywheel idea. Uh, it's kind of neat. We're giving um, glitch-free power. And of course, fiber everywhere. So we're looking forward to, to having that set up. And what we have set up now is in the existing building. So we're already getting a modern, nice new infrastructure. And so what's the status of that? So we launched the new core infrastructure last week. Um, so Friday, we were thinking, do we wait? Do we not wait? Like, what the hell, let's go for it, what could go wrong? So um, here's the pointer to the documentation for the, the new system. Uh, there we have a nice new uh, tape silo system, just running production features that will be nice, home directories, group files, beyond flash. Um, 
we've adopted the Weka file system for our data. And the science data will be um, basically Weka plus a Ceph uh, object store backend. But the nice thing about Weka is it gives you a POSIX and a necessary interface. So if you didn't want to think of it as an object URL, you can just wander around via a POSIX connect. Uh, most things will be deployed through Kubernetes and the batch system is uh, Slurm. And in the startup, we have a single Roma partition. Uh, the guy running the show is Italian. Um, and Ruben is the first group on S3. We're the only ones there right now. Okay, so some details. Um, those of you who've been already signing on will be happy to know that you can start ignoring your Windows accounts. Uh, the new system is, is Unix only. Um, and that's how the authentication will be done. Currently, there's still a password change every six months. But as zero trust architecture comes our way from the White House, uh, the use of Duo will expand. And I assume at least a benefit will be that the password changes will become much less frequent. Uh, no VPN needed. A Duo is only needed if you're going to the web portals, but not if you're using no machine direct SSH or RSP. Um, we have two tiers of homes of space for your users. So there's a default home directory that comes with the cluster. It's on flash, 25 gigabytes, uh, but we're providing the usual one terabyte per user directories in our group space. And I'm giving you a pointer to where that is. Uh, again, for those of you who've come on board already and are used to the SDF system, they're separate file systems. So you get new home directories, and the group space, SDF group Ruben, actually resolves to a different place. But you have full access to all the cluster file system for SDF by this FSDDN SDF um, path. So it's all there, but just a note that it's, it's a different system. Okay, so how's it gonna look? So we've updated the dev guide, and this just went into, the, into main this morning. So this tells you, I hope, everything you need to know to start getting on board. Uh, we're trying to make it look as much like NCSA storage as we can. Um, and so similarly, there's a Bastion host, a Bastion a load balancer, and then there's a Ruben load balancer. Uh, you need to get to the Ruben DevL node to do actual work. Um, so as KT mentioned, uh, the releases are now uh, the dailies are now available, which is the next bullet. Uh, but weeklies and releases are provided by CVMFS, courtesy of Fabio. Um, daily builds are coming in there. I think the Jenkins builds are coming soon after. There's a staff RSP. And for those of you who love BPS, um, we're planning on three options for uh, the workflow of that. Uh, HT Condor has been tried out, Parcel, is in heavy use by desk and is documented there. And Panda's a little further down the road, we think. Okay, so now just a few examples of how things look. So here's the splash page for the developer node. Uh, and then I show you what the group space looks like. So basically you have uh, data sets as the precursor data. There's shared storage, there's the, the usual repos. Um, the shared software stack. And then here's where the user directories go with the one terabyte quota. So again, the color coding, uh, the blue stuff is on flash. The orange is in our tiered Weka space. Um, and uh, as we continue to unpack the data, the copies of your home directories and your JHOMs uh, will be linked into there so you can copy them into your S3DF space. Okay, and then where we are today, um, your terabytes are waiting for you. Uh, the shared stacks are done. Uh, for the Butler repos, currently you have right access to the HSCRC2 uh, repo. Um, and um, the shared storage is there, and precursor there is, data is there for HSC and DC2. Um, I'll come back to that. Okay, so Butler access, here's some examples, either from the command line of firing up the stack and the most recent uh, weekly, 32, um, 
and then just accessing the butler, and also by using the dailies. Uh, a reminder, so if, you're, if you've already been on, uh, you'll have to have a dbauth YAML file in your .lsst directory. And if you've already been on, we've changed uh, in bringing up the copy of the NCSA butler, uh, we've changed the name of the database. So you'll have to go in and fix that. And then the last example is oh, same thing from USDF-RSP. So you have your choices and how you want to do things. Okay, so known issues and open policies. So we really kicked this off you know, Thursday, Friday. And we had been kicking the tires through the weekend. And we found you know, and fixed many issues. And in fact, we, fi we just fixed the one, the first bullet there. There was a startup delay doing a walking issue in NFS, and and Yi just fixed that. So now it's starting up zippy fine. So that's I can just scratch that out. Uh, we're working on providing uh, Butler authentication via your existing Unix account, but in the meantime, there's a shared secret. Um, there's a there's a basically there's a bug in the deployment of the uh, existing account access. Um, okay, so we are still unpacking NCS data at Slack. Uh, as Will mentioned, we have all of it through August 27th. We have the diff lists through August 1st, and Brandon is uh, getting that data to Slack. Um, things that, we, that are still on the, on the plate. Um, EFD is set up. We now have to mirror the data to it. That will take a little while. Uh, KT is working on the routine transfer of summit data. Uh, we're expecting that to be ready this week. Um, and uh, with S3DF, we'll have some Panda uh, configurations that we have to sort out. But you can keep using the old SDF one for the moment, especially for the HSC reprocessing. Uh, for policies, um, we're going to have to sort out as a group how to manage the group and shared space. I think NCSA was a free-for-all and that had certain properties to it. Uh, I'm a little more of a fan of quoted spaces, so I'll have to have that discussion. And then generally the backup policies of how the basically all of this stuff gets backed up into our nice new um, group silo. Okay, timeline. Um, as I said, S3DF core infrastructure released last week. Uh, we've tagged 166 people to have access. And in fact, if you're one of the 166, and I'll be letting you know after this meeting, um, you can go. Tr you can go try it. Uh, the doors are open. NCSA goes dark in a week, um, so we're, as I said, confirming the files. Uh, did we really get it all? It's our last chance to verify. And we're placing the files. So what we've done is we've got the the butler has been transferred. The paths have been updated to point to where the files will be. And as they appear, then the, then those references will be real. Um, one thing we still have to do is to uh, rationalize the user ID and the group IDs across the files that have been uh, brought over. Uh, the long haul network between Slack and Summit is now set up and under test. That was good, because we were limited to a gigabit before that. Uh, again, complete Summit transfers, get EFD populated. Um, we have a four petabyte storage array. Um, we didn't have time to get the Weka Flash plus Ceph backend uh, on it. So what we've done is we've installed ZFS on it, uh, on two pet on half of it. And we've been using that um, in the meantime. And when the Weka uh, piece will be done, we'll flip flop. Um, currently, just in terms of space, we may need to leave data sets in Luster until some new storage comes in. I'll tell you about that in a moment. And so, it was a bit of a hodgepodge of file systems to put that group space together. Okay, resources. So what do we have now? So we have that four petabytes. Uh, we actually have a handful of petabytes loaned uh, from Slack in Luster. Uh, 2,000 cores in batch. Uh, Slack has loaned us 1,000 while we're ordering more. Uh, two developer nodes, they're nice beefy nodes, and 500 uh, Kubernetes nodes, cores, of course. Uh, and then on order, the order just went out. Uh, and this, so 
last fall, we ordered that stuff for Comcam support. And before we knew we'd be supporting developers and commissioners. So with supply chain issues, um, this is what we were able to get in time. Uh, for LSST CAM, which is now more than a year from now, uh, we've ordered up another 11, 11 petabytes of disk and tape, respectively. Another 5,000 cores, 1,000 Kubernetes cores, um, data transfer nodes, and for uh, Fritz and company, some hefty uh, QServe nodes to get going. Okay, some, some thank yous. So a lot of work has gone into this transition. We, in January, uh, Will said, like, can you take over this year? And we went, okay, uh, and it was a lot of work. Um, so many, many thanks go to our NCSA colleagues, especially uh, Michelle Butler, Steve Podrovitz. You know, we couldn't have done this transition without their wholehearted support. So thank you, thank you. Um, and then the, the work to get ready. So our computing folks, um, this was not their schedule. Their schedule was to release in October. And they put a lot of effort into getting us together in time. Uh, another individual, so Brandon White has lived this data transfer since April. Uh, not only ju you know, just transferring four petabytes of small files from a complicated tree, but also the receiving end. So thank you. Uh, Wei and Yi are just like central to uh, getting all the infrastructure together, um, just all the file systems, the Kubernetes stuff, RSP, all of that. And then KT is just KT. I mean, he's provided the adult supervision and he knows everything. So he's been great. And for those of you who remember, just think of, of Spock in the School of Waters episode. Okay, so that's what I got. Um, when you go look at the documentation, you'll see there's a couple of Slack channels that you really should um, subscribe to. So USDF is for asking questions. It's kind of been our DM infrastructure. Um, and then announcements uh, will go into USDF announce. Okay, what you got? Thanks, Richard. Uh, any questions for Richard or anything else that came up already before we switch over? Don't hesitate, come on. I see someone edge on the edge of their seat. No, no, no questions. Both clear? Good. Um, all right, if there's no questions. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I thought that was important for everybody to get like a little overview. I know there were lots of questions before about USDF. I think it was very comprehensive uh, and you hit all of the right things. And I'm guessing some people are busy logging in already. Leanne says, could you please upload your slides to the session webpage? On confluence or the session? The, the PCW. Okay, so if you can upload them to the PCW page, if you can do that, that will be nice. Atta you can attach them at the end, upload slides. And I see a hand over there. Please come to the microphone so that everybody can hear you on, on blue jeans because there are a few people on. Hi, thank you for the good talk. Just a um, quick question. You have mentioned during course there a plan for the data facilities. Um, you didn't mention GPUs. Was that will be available for like LSP or search? Good question. Um, so GPUs are not in the operation spec. So the data release processing does not require them, uh, nor does the prompt processing. So uh, we have not um, put any into our budget for GPUs. And that said, Slack does have a GPU farm that it gives access to. So um, so the short term is that there are GPUs out there. Um, I'll need to talk to our TID buddies about that. And you know, we have a long-term hardware budget and you know, it can evolve. So maybe Will wants to comment. Yeah, I think well, Frosty would like to add, and maybe I, I guess she's going to add that we do have Google credits, and we have a Google thing, and we can we can, put, and we also have in kind potentially in kind contributions that may provide GPUs. I think one of them already says they will, right? So there's at least one in kind contribution saying that their facility will have GPUs. I think the important thing is what Richard said. We haven't baseline GPU for any of the algorithms for for release processing or prompt processing, so we do not need them at the moment. 
but we do want to be able to experiment with them because somebody may come along and go, hey, we can do this image differencing 15 times faster if we use these GPUs, and then we would like to do them. So we'll have places where you can play with that, uh, but, but it's not officially in his budget yet. But then remember, this budget has to be updated every year or every couple of years at least. So you know, there's nothing to stop us changing something in the future. But right now, baseline is we're just going for all normal machines, and especially ones we can use with Kubernetes and um, and get around easily. So very very similar architecture all the way across. That was good. Uh, anything else, Robert? Please microphone. I can't hear Robert. Yeah, he's coming up. He's coming up. Said anything yet? I still don't hear Robert. <laughs> <laughs> hey Richard. Um, hey Robert. What's, what's your projection for stability and usability of USDF over the next six months? I mean, you, next next spring you expect to have your new fancy thing. Should we be expecting? 20% duty cycle, 100% duty cycle, disk failures. I mean, just what do you see as we transition to using this in reality over the next year or six months even? Okay, uh, let me give you my expectations and I know the way and we are on. And they can pop up if I am too optimistic. I mean, this is a brand, it's a brand new infrastructure. It's gone into a well-supported existing building. Um, and so I don't expect any issues there. Um, over the next months. The hardware is, uh, I think, top of, essentially top of the line hardware. So it's not like we're making use of old crap. Um, there may well be some infant mortality, but you know, th these are our modern systems where we shouldn't notice. So I think you know, with Flash for, the, for a lot of the system, uh, I think the, you know, the Weka folks, we expect you know, the light source people at Slack have had excellent service from them. We're expecting that to go smoothly. So I, I'm thinking that the base that we're building on should be quite solid. All right. Everybody's happy? As happy as you can be? All right. Okay, no more hands. Uh, I'm gonna switch over to Tim then, right? Let me uh, see if I can get this open up here. Oh, we need to go back to Blue Jeans though and share it, right? Share screen. Share this screen. All right. Right, so the great news is we don't need to talk about Gen 2 anymore. Except, I need some reviewers for Eli's Pipe Tasks ticket because once we get that out the window, we're done and we can delete it all and we can just kill pipe drivers and there's not a single piece of Gen 2 code left anywhere in the, in the code base, which would be awesome. It's what we've been working towards. Uh, right, so that was the important thing. Um, so just as a general note in case people have missed what's been going on, um, so in the last year, we've completely changed how visit handling works for, um, because of the way that we changed the observing system so that visits um, are now um, indicated in the headers. So it will say which snap is essentially related. We changed the way visits work. Um, so now the system can work out a visit as the file appears. It doesn't have to try and guess based on, oh, well, you know, these three files look like they're related. It will just say this is the first of the two visits and this is the second of the two snaps. And that caused us to do a big schema change which people probably didn't notice, but that, that, that'll work fine and I think we're now good um, for dealing with summit observing. Um, for the people that aren't involved in stack usage, you can now pip install the entire middleware and it will just work and you don't need AFW or anything like that. Um, People like Gregory are very happy for that because SphereX at NASA can just use middleware without having to pull everything else in. Uh, Will's already mentioned the tech note, uh, the SPIE paper. Um, Jim Bosch did want us to note that the new pipe task purge and pipe task cleanup commands exist because it wasn't entirely clear if people knew about those. Um, if you recall, when you do a pipe task run, it will create uh, time stamped um, run collections and chain everything together, and it can be quite annoying to clean things out, to remove just the some old run collections, 
um, without sort of destroying your chained collection and getting rid of all the inputs and it all getting messy, but the purge and cleanup commands so simplify that so you can put a base collection name and it will sort out how to delete all the timestamp collections for you. Um, we also added remove runs because pruned collections was terrifyingly um, um, accurate and explosive really in how it deleted everything including the input collections so people were running prune collections on their chained collection and it was destroying the input raws. So that was very bad. Now remove runs will now just let you remove your output, output runs. Um, export calibs uh, for people who are creating masters, uh, master biases, darks and flats and whatever at one place and they want to move them to the summit. Export Calibs is now much cleverer and you can limit it and just say just this data set type in this collection and it will sort it all out for you. Um, and also transfer data sets now does exactly what you expected it to do before but it didn't in the sense that it will now copy everything it needs into the new one, new collection, uh, the new repository. So if you've got a big uh, repo main, whatever, NCSA, and you create a little SQLite type thing, you can actually transfer data sets between the two, and it should just work. So you can then play around with your SQLite version. Um, now, in terms of what the work coming up in the near term, um, people involved in execution will have noticed and complained about the fact that when they do BPS submit, it can sometimes take an hour just to create this thing called the execution butler. Uh, which is a SQLite um, repository of everything that was the, all the inputs and all the outputs of your processing. Now, what we're trying to do, it's already making a quantum graph, so what we're changing is the ability of all the Panda and the BPS system to use the quantum graph directly, um, so it won't need the SQLite, and that will shave like an hour off some submission times. Um, we're doing integrated ops core for the IVOA people in the room. The, um, when you do your obs tap query on the portal, it can see the raw data and the process data through the generic IVOA, inter IVOA interface, but at the moment you have to do an explicit export to make that happen. What we're working on is making it so that you can just declare this a table to be an obs core table, and every time you do a butler put, it will actually make a record in the obs core table so that obs tap will magically work. This will let people use the standard portal tooling as new observations arrive in near real time on the mountain uh, without having to do any special, um, use any special tooling to see what was observed last night. Um, Jim Bosch is completely rewriting the query engine and it's gonna be awesome and I can't really explain exactly what is gonna be awesome about it but it's gonna be great and hopefully it will make the qu quantum graph building quicker which is the real thing that kills everybody at the moment. So with these things happening, BPS submit will be fast. Well, faster, put it that way. Because, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of data sets to go through. It can't, it's not a necessarily a trivial thing. Um, coming in the longer term still, um, we are planning on adding proper provenance so you can work out what actually, you can ask the question, what actually went into da this data set? At the moment, you can't tell. You've got a data set there, it's got a data ID. You can look up things like, well, here was the config that was used, and this was the t date it was run, but I'm not really sure. I haven't got the quantum graph anymore because that was temporary and deleted. And you can't really work out what the inputs were, that's, but that's what we're gonna add. Um, we're also gonna start writing things like the data, the, the data set ID, the UUID, and the data ID into the file headers so that if someone gives you a random file, you can actually go back and say, well, I've got this random file. Where the hell did it come from? And actually look it up in the butler and then follow through the provenance that way. Uh, client server butler is still here as the savior of everything. And it's gonna be very, very difficult. Um, and we haven't got a great big team to work on it. So we're hopeful, but in the near term, this is not happening. Hopefully, in the longer term, we've sort of promised that maybe it has to be ready for CONCAM. That's gonna be, uh, yeah, thank you, Frosty. Um, so anyway, we don't know about that. Um, the other things, we have question marks. Uh, metrics handling, we talked about this at the, a recent DMLT meeting. Um, now, you can envisage a scheme where the alert processing runs and um, a metric gets created and you want that to get back to the telescope as fast as possible. One way to do that is to have a, um, a data store backend that is not a file on disk but is like a Sasquatch system or a 
Kafka broker or something. So you can just send the metric directly and it will go there as quickly as possible without having to wait for the actual processing to finish. So that's one thing we're looking at. We haven't really come up with a, a timeline for doing that yet. Uh, annotations, that's another thing that we could do if people wanted us to do it. This is, a, this is a, um, be able to an, a, associate a comment with a data set. So you can say any, any, any Butler data set, you can just say, I think this data looks like crap and have it stored in the Butler or Butler adjacent so that you could, somebody else could come along and say, give me all the annotations for this data set. Now, we could do that. No one's really asking it for us at the moment. There's sort of this discussion that maybe campaign tooling will have a completely separate thing where they will do that. Um, but in theory, we could add annotations as an integral part of Butler, but no one's really driving that at the moment. Um, other things of interest that we are, that keep being on the list at like priority three and so haven't quite happened. Um, the a public API for pipe task, at the moment when you're in a notebook and you say, I wanna run this pipeline with just one data ID, it's, it's really quite complicated. There's one API that you can use at the moment, but it's a bit too simple and it doesn't give you access to all the options. Um, so making, that, making it easier to run pipelines with larger numbers of data sets from within the notebook Obviously not a huge batch production. This I'm talking like two or three data IDs so you can do an experimental co-ad or something. Um, but that would be really nice because at the moment you have to jump into the shell and do pipe task run yourself. Um, and we're hoping that with the parcel system now being integrated into BPS, we should be able to start doing a slightly bigger CI using BPS itself in Jenkins so you can run like CI HSC Gen 3. And it might be, a, we, we should be able to make that run faster by making it use a few more nodes or something rather than it taking an hour, which it does at the moment. And then you also have to run CI IMSIM, which is also taking an hour. So these are sort of things we're talking about. Um, but that's my slide. I didn't realize you had allocated me 15 minutes. I thought I only had five. So, so anyway, is there any questions uh, or any cheering? Yeah. Oh, and there I would like to congratulate the team. Sorry. I would like to congratulate the team for winning the Aura Team Award this year. That, that would be great. So. There's a quick question. Um, so, yeah, first, fears on getting, getting Poplar 2 exercised um, and, and Gen 3 in. How do we learn about all of this? Uh, especially I'm thinking in terms of commissioning team. Uh, how do we, are, is there a user guide we can start sending folks to uh, with you know, key commands to use, explanations of what happens, so the expected behavior, like the, you know, if something takes an hour to just warn people, is there yeah, anything so, we can? Yeah, so Pipeline's LSSTIO, the tutorial is fully Gen 3. Um, if you look at the pipe based documentation in LSST, uh, in pipelines LSST.io, there's an incredibly detailed description of how to write pipeline tasks. Um, and, the, and if you're into the coding side of it, you want to add a new algorithm or something. And so Nate Lust did a great job of writing that documentation. Um, so, so, so for the running side of it, like, you know, the tutorial some, tells some, you, some the tutorial data. has a big sample HSC data set with a full set of processing that you can run through. I think it's sometimes, it can actually take like two or three hours if you run the full processing. All right, we'll take uh, a look. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, okay, and, and Frosty has just said that there's also, of course, all of the tutorials for DP02, all those notebooks are all using Gen 3, so that's, that's not in the pipeline execution side of things, but in the how to get your data and how to use query data sets and all that stuff, that's all there. You might have a question about um, the tools uh, around, uh, operational tools around uh, DP, around Butler. So do you plan, I, I, I don't know if, I, I am thinking of tools, for instance, for patching the database when you have to move the, the, the files from one location to the other or right. something like this. Yeah. So do you plan to include that in the release or to include that as a separate package or, I mean, to make them available and support it? Yeah, okay. So we have a set of admin tools, which is called Daft Butler Migrate at the moment, which allows you to do all the schema migrations and the, and we, we probably, and there is something that will let you rewrite SQLite databases with a new thing. Um, yeah, the whole, you've relocated the bucket for where all the raws are located and they're a direct URL into the data store. 
that happens a lot and it seems like we will have to write some support tooling for just doing that because it's not a very difficult right it's just essentially a regex inside a, yeah, a, a SQL you are, query you aren't the only ones who know how yeah. to do that so yeah okay yeah we we definitely will, are open to having that sort of tooling supported yeah and second comments also we, what we noticed that um dp02 there is a lot of uh, directory is created with a single file in it it's probably so i have to submit a, a, a jury about this because i think that they may pose problems in, in right so areas. if you're talking about the directory uh, files there there is a conceptual issue with the resource path infrastructure the resource path is the thing that abstracts the io so google cloud storage s3 local files they all just it's all just transparent to the butler yeah. um, one of the problems is if at the moment the way we've done it is if you do resource path mkd it will create a zero byte file called that directory in the object store because the object stores don't have any concept of directories and i'm not really sure whether that's a bug or a feature um, and so maybe we should just make mkd be a no-op in our object store land and see how we get that on. That may be a problem for when you are using POSIX file system and not when you are using Yeah, so POSIX store, will make a directory, but yeah, yeah object then, stores don't need it. But then you, you, you have one directory, uh, thousands of directories with one file in it, and this poses problem for the metadata handler. Oh, you're talking an actual data set in there. Okay, yeah, we can talk about that later, but yeah. that's li really a function of what the pipeline data ID and everything is generating, yeah. so, uh, so the template. So problems, so I just... Okay, uh, okay. How detailed do you expect the provenance sort of return to be on a given task? when, for example, if I were to patch or batch process a bunch of images through ISR using some standard calibration collections, the provenance would then return the calibration collection name, the actual images that are in that calibration collection. It would be the actual data process. set that was used. So we're essentially going to convert the graph into provenance. So the graph has the actual data set. It says this specific master, calib master bias is coming from here and will be used by the ISR task. Okay. And so that will be recorded. The, the trickier thing is like when you're doing a co-add and you want, you've got 100 files as input and only 99 of them are used. So the actual provenance versus the predicted provenance is also something we've got to deal with. But that's more of a task thing. The task has to tell us it only used 99 of the inputs. It was Merlin's. Um, so do you have the power to compel people to help review pipe tasks Gen 2 removal? No, but Yuzra does. <laughs> Yuzra clearly can do that, right? She's a magician. Yeah? But if we can get it done this week, what you should do is you should basically allocate yourself each a couple of files, a couple of the task files, do that review, just say, I've reviewed these two, and then move on because it's a huge one, it's like 100 files have been changed or something, so no one person should be allowed to just do that review, but if, if you all group together by the end of the week, we can merge it and be Gen 2 free. Just like the old days where we ported to Python 3 or PyTest, right? Pipe task, Gen 2 removal. No. So, um, sorry, I, I'm not sure if the blue jeans hand raised thing is working. I just, uh, uh, Tim mentioned applause and I just wanted to just note briefly again, as was said on a couple of the slides, we are using the Gen 3 middleware for the uh, NASA SphereX um, infrared spectral survey mission um, for the pipelines. It's a considerably different data model um, and kind of, kind of execution processing model from the Rubin Observatory, um, it's serving us well already. Um, the ability to just transparently move from POSIX file systems to cloud storage is fantastic and suits what we need to do uh, just fine. And I think this is a um, great example of reusable software. So I just want to thank the whole team for doing a, a phenomenal job with making this usable outside of the Rubin context. We have one more question, I think, online. Kenneth, speak. Oh, yeah, just on the uh, Gen 2 removal thing again. I remember there was a thread on Slack 
somewhere about trying to coordinate that. Does anybody remember where that is? For saying, you know, okay, I'll do this part or somebody else does that part, that kind of stuff. Apparently it's Eli's ticket and Eli is down there. Will you just talk to Ken directly? He wants to help do some reviewing. All right, good. He'll, I'll send you his, yeah, I'll, I'll send you a Slack message with his, his ID in it. So I'll put you guys together. We'll hand over to Christian. All right, cool. Thank you. So the long haul network, everybody heard the name? And the name seems to be coined in 2005 by Tim or Jeff, right? It's supposed to be this high-speed network that will transfer data from uh, Chile to the USDF, right? So the network is built, right? It's supposed to transfer uh, from Summit to Slack in seven seconds. That's the huge requirement. And um, it's a primary path of 100 gigs, and uh, which is exclusive for us. And uh, there's a secondary path with a shared connection with a guarantee 40 gigs. So worst case, we get 40 gigs from Chile to Slack. This is from the base, not from the summit. From the, between summit and base, we have all sort of connections, which is actually 600 gigs, right? But the important one is living Chile, okay? This is mostly a, a, a BGP network, right? We share prefixes between Slack and Chile. So we can actually, you know, define what kind of uh, traffic do we want in the long haul network, right? Um, so some of the th things are gonna happen soon in the long haul network that could be of interest. Uh, one of them is the Slack connectivity. So that's happening right now. So uh, Richard, Mark, thank you very much. Also the ESNet guys. Uh, it's almost there. We're almost reaching Summit to Slack using the long haul network. So that's fantastic. Um, we're going to get more personas on the network. The personas are the, the, the system that we use to test the network and verify that everything is, is fine and we have the speed that we need and we don't have delays and we don't have lost packages and everything. Right? We're going to get more, more of those. Um, we're also working in the network verification uh, end to end. Uh, uh, Josh. Uh, and I and some other engineers in the group are working in this document, the LDM 732, and that's supposed to be happening on March next year, right? Why? Because by the end of this year, we're going to be working in something called the ACI, right? I'm going to be talking about that later. So one picture worth more than southern words. Yeah, let me change this. There you go. That's the long-haul network from uh, Chile to Slack. So to the left, uh, you see the infamous Chilean uh, side of the connection that goes from uh, Santiago to uh, La Serena. It's pretty much a layer two, right? So we don't have uh, uh, layer three between Santiago and La Serena. It's just several points of amplification of the signal. It's DWDM. And uh, that fiber, the, if you have experienced any problems with the long-haul network in the past, is because that fiber has been shot, has been cut, has been stolen, has been burned. So I'm looking forward for the poison of the fiber. I mean, it's really, it's really amazing. Now the backup link is working perfectly fine. So at least we get with our 40 uh, gigabytes, right? Per gigabytes. Um, yeah, as you can see, uh, it's a very long fiber. It's about 100,000 kilometers of fiber. That's two times around the world. Uh, half of that, almost half, is underwater, right? Because we have two paths. One will go into the Pacific and then the Atlantic, right? Um, we're crossing six countries, and uh, we have 16 points of presence, so that means that there's a switch in that location, right? And we have uh, 15 engineers from different, you know, uh, r &E organizations. And uh, while not part of the long haul network, uh, the exit to, the, to Europe, to UK and France, it's done by four points on the uh, east coast of the, of the states, right? Uh, that's part of the... Uh, Slack and ESNet configuration, and the decision to which point is, is going to use is just routing base. I think it's Boston, New York, and Washington, and two New York, something like that, right? But again, that's not part of the long haul network. The long haul network is between Chile and Slack. All right, so I talked before about the ACI. The ACI is this uh, technology that we have in, the, in Ruben, and we're going to change it because it's too complex, right? And why is this going to affect the long haul network? Because uh, um, it affects the connection between summit and base, right? And this is 
Um, and one of the reasons that we're changing it. So we're going to move to a, a core collapse network. It's going to be multi-vendor. We're not going to be bound to a single vendor. We're going to remove the complexity of the network layer. So it makes no sense to have a complex network and you know uh, more complexity on top of it. So it has to be a simple network and build complexity on top of that. Um, that's going to help us to troubleshoot this, right? And Actually, it's going to help us to get more help from the community, right? Because now we have a very closed system that uh, only the vendor knows how to, how to use it. And it's going to be easier and cheaper to scale, right? Because we can use any vendor. We just, we just buy what we need, and we don't buy this, you know, huge system with a lot of features that we don't need. So this is going to happen very soon. Um, we actually started the, this, this evaluation a couple of years ago. Uh, the chipping of hardware, of, you know, it's difficult. The hardware was just chipped uh, a couple of weeks ago, despite we, we purchased it like uh, last year. So uh, by the end of the year, we should have a much more simplified uh, network in Rubin. And hopefully, it's going to be the best for all of us. All right? Thank you. Don't run away, there might be some questions. Any questions for Christian? Oh, yeah. No, no questions online, no questions here. All right. Uh, We're done a little bit early, that's absolutely fine. Um, do please go straight out the door and straight out onto the lawn and hopefully Emily is there and she's gonna take a photo of everyone in the DM session. Uh, obviously people online, sorry, you can't make that. Um, uh, we'll, maybe we'll Photoshop you in afterwards. So hopefully on the lawn just outside here, we'll find... Sir? Okay, so please, on those people online, please do uh, turn on your camera and Leanne will take a screenshot and we'll see if we can put you beside everybody else afterwards. And everybody else in here, about five minutes. Okay, I'm good. Sorry. We couldn't hear you, Leanne. I can turn this on. What do you want to say? You ready? Take another one now. So everybody ready? It's good. Page. That sounds about well, we're 47 people on. There's about 40 on the page. Not everybody has, has their camera on 35. Okay. All right, everybody. That's the end. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for joining in late, George, especially. See you one of these days in person. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone.